Hey everybody, I just noticed I'm having a technical difficulty to get the recording done. So hold on one moment while I try to fix that. Me now. I am Laura Stewart, the Director of Online Channel Events for SASMAX, and I am just getting everything started and making sure that our recording is going, and it appears to be doing that perfectly. So yay, thank you so much, technology. I am excited to have you all here today for our Crossing the Chasm event, where we're going to be talking about how data creates the bridge to your perfect partner. Excited to have you all here from around the world. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because so many people are listening live from many different time zones as well. Little housekeeping. This webinar is going to last approximately 30 minutes, and it's really not a webinar. It's more of a fireside web chat between um, SASMAX's own channel chief, Clint Gatewood, and Dave Sobel, um, a serial channel chief and an MSP, and just one of those all around amazing people that we're going to share so much amazing data with you. If you have any questions, please type your questions in the question pane, and I will be monitoring those throughout. And if you have any technical issues like I just had, please feel free to reach out to me as well. I will be monitoring the chat and the question pane throughout the webinar. So let's get started. I have like have the honor to introduce you to Clinton Gate with the SASMAX channel chief and a dear personal friend. So Clint, why don't you pop on and introduce Dave and let's get started. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending where you're at, uh, I'm afternoon here. But it is great, thank you, Laura. I've known Laura for a very long time. And it's very interesting that uh, Laura was a partner of mine back when I was uh, channel chief at Zenith Infotech. She was a partner of mine, and coincidentally, uh, so was my guest, uh, Dave Sobel, who I've known for a very long time and, and started out knowing him as a uh, an MSP that we recruited. If you want to go to the next slide, that'd be fine as we're, as we're bringing Dave on, because I'm already talking about him as, as we bring him on. So uh, Dave's become a really good friend, and that's kind of the way that the channel does work. You end up with uh, some very good friends uh, throughout the years that you continue to work with. Uh, I left where I was at, and Dave left where he was. He jumped into a lot of roles like what I was doing when I got to know him, and I went on to some different pieces. And today we're back together to talk about you know, how to how to really build out uh, your best channel program and find your best channel partners and how data really has is, is, is gotten to a level now. Uh, it's finally getting to the level that it's really, really strategic and really good in, in, in being active, actual that you can really go after things. So these are some of Dave's credentials here. Like I said, he's been a football channel chief. I've tracked his career for a while. Dave, you want to say hello? And uh, Oh, well, thank, thanks for having me, Clint. It's great to be on the show and, and chat with everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is kind of a reminder of old days gone by. <laughs> when we you know, it, it, it was funny when, it, when we put this all together, it was like, wow, okay, I've been doing this in different sides for a little while now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. A little bit more diverse than me. I, I've never been a managed service provider or worked on the solution provider side before, but I did get to know one being, you know, that we were the first sponsor of HTG and you were part of that. I got to go to every meeting. Arnold did a great job for me and, and bring me in and let me learn about the business model. So I felt like I was an MSP. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I did the MSP thing for about a decade, sold that business, then hopped over on the vendor side, worked for uh, you know, two different companies under four different names over time uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> because of sales and, and helping those get, get acquired and, and moving through that. And I recently left the vendor side to go back out and focus on community and, and kind of... Uh, thought leadership side and now do podcasting via MSP radio. So that's my current current bit. I do a daily show called The Business of Tech and I do a weekly show called Killing It where we analyze issues in the channel. Great, fantastic, well, that's great. So well, we're gonna kind of jump into uh, some of the topics we wanted to talk about today. And it's really kind of a fireside chat as uh, it was it was mentioned by Laura there. If you have questions throughout as we, as we begin talking, please type them in. Uh, get them put in there and Laura if it's really pertinent to what we're talking about at that point we'll bring those up and answer those pieces um, on that piece but one of the things I want to start out with is 
And I know it was it was that way when I, I kind of look at how we did channels back in Zenith Day and when Dave first started getting into channels, a lot of it was just brute force, traditional, what I call traditional now is you send out thousands of emails, you start calling up resellers, you recruit everybody, you try and onboard them. I kind of call that traditional. And part of that is one of the KPIs that we used to always use is how many partners I signed this month compared to what I signed last month. Because if I don't sign more this month, my growth curve stops and it, it, it drops off. So what do you think, Dave, on that piece? How, how much do you use the organization as a, as a key performance piece that uh, you would have used? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to hear, we're going to pull the audience and hear what, what they're thinking. You know, everywhere that I've been, it was always a conversation about how many new partners do we add? How many new partners do we add? That, that just was, it was the dominated piece. And, and what's interesting is, is that uh, I'm finding both really agile vendors now are the ones that are not just asking that question, but also those that have been doing it for a while have realized that it's not a great, necessarily a great metric because it just tells you how many people you signed up. It doesn't tell you anything about what they're going to do for you. And, right. and so you're just looking at that. It is, it's really not looking at even the, the important part of the picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, th I think the same way, because we used to use that. And when I look at today and look at where one of the reasons I came to, to where I'm at today at SASMAX is because of the data and the data, data engines that, that we were uh, developing and put together and really brought to fruition. But it, it really gives you that opportunity if you look at, you know, I'm going to spend overall, if you really do your calculations right, and especially when you're looking at the IT service channels, you know, your cost of partner acquisition to get them to sign and to get them onboarded, but to just to get them signed and start onboarding them and then hopefully get to that first sale, you're, you're investing $3,000, $4,000 mm -hmm. over a, a three, four, five month period. And in many cases, the, the partner you bring on is, they don't do much. They might bring one or two sales and drop off, right? Totally. Um, and it looks so, like the, the audience we're talking to is is kind of split there between 45% you know, that are saying it's in the top five, but 36% saying it's not that important, which is, is interesting and, and encouraging actually to see people that are, that are saying it's not necessarily the most important one. Exactly, exactly. And there's some people that says, hey, it's, it's number one. And then other people are saying, I'm struggling to find out really what my KPIs are. And, no, but, it, but it's interesting when you look at, okay, so I'm, I am dropping three to $5,000 to get someone onboarded and make a few sales. But I mm -hmm. think, it, you know, there was one question, uh, Laura, that I think came in of, you know, I get these new partners that come in and they just start selling like crazy and then they just drop off and die off. I'm sure you've seen that. What, what you, how would you answer that? Yeah, what's what's interesting to note is is actually I would expect that to be pretty typical behavior for a for a solution provider coming on board, particularly because if you think of if you're targeting in the managed services space, you're generally going to sign somebody. They're going to onboard, particularly if they go deep, they're going to sign most of their customers up. That's the quick part, and then it's going to taper off as you fall into line with their traditional sales funnel. You know, oftentimes for a lot of solution providers, you know, they're signing in, in an average solution provider that's probably doing a million or, or so revenue. They're probably signing one to three customers a month. So, you know, at best, you may keep pay, complete pace with their cycle, but you're not certainly not going to outpace any more than they're signing up. You know, if you move into a VAR, you know, a VAR who's much more transactional, perhaps you're going to sell across their 200 or so accounts, sell quickly, and then again, fall into their transactional pattern. I would actually be much more alarmed by somebody who said, hey, I signed up a partner and they only sold one or two deals and then that's it. That actually is a lesser engaged partner. If, if you're spiking and then leveling, I'm expecting that behavior. Yeah, and I, I find that I've, I've talked to several companies that are recruiting channel that aren't in necessarily the IT services channel. They're like, hey, they're active if they've made one deal. I'm like, okay, so one deal is great. I, 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 don't, I don't prescribe to that. <laughs> right. I want a consistency. I want something. I want some predictable revenue coming out of it. And just because someone activated once or gave you one referral, to me, that's just not enough to, to consider it a channel partner. Um, maybe an affiliate or something like that, but not really a a solid channel partner so whenever you looked at um you know if we're spending so much money to recruit those channel partners and we're investing so much time in enabling them and we know that most channel companies are running a five to twenty percent activation rate uh, mm -hmm. over 20 they're very lucky but most i talk to are net five to 15 meaning that 15 out of every 
hundred partners you sign do really well with you. Yep. The cost to recruit that those resellers in the first place is three to five thousand dollars. That's a lot of spend that you're <laughs> you've spent on. Have you really identified the right partner in the first place as you're going out to market? How, how would you address that? Yeah, I mean, it's it, you know, it, and you're going to have to do a couple of things to do this. You, know, you can first off, you can invest in figuring out better lists. You know, fo focus on making sure that I'm targeting the right people by collecting good data or looking ahead and being much more aggressive about saying, "Hey, I need to. I know something about these people before I sign them up." Um, you know, then the other way is this is why we ha we get the creation of these tiered partner programs because we allow people to come in easily at a low level, but then the the benefits are for engagement. You know, oftentimes you're going to be spending a lot of time up front post sign to figure out who they are and what their potential is and mine there. So the better you can be at each of those steps, you're going to be a lot less wasteful. Yeah, really know who your buyer persona is, right? And who is your best mm -hmm. partner. And it's not right. just that they're an, they're an MSP, right? It's not just that they're an ad agency if you're selling on the other side of the MarTech space. It's, it's are they aligned with what your product does? Do they have the right clients? Do they have the right client sizes? Do they have the expertise? It, it gets really in depth so that, I, and I know when I, when I first talked to you about coming here, you were really interested in the segmentation piece because one, that gives you the best targets and two, you can really market to them. Well, and the other thing that's yeah, the other thing that's interesting is is and oftentimes I've seen this mistake from a, a lot of vendors, particularly when I was on the solution provider side, is they go to market with one single message, thinking that all solution providers are exactly the same, and that's so completely not true. You know, I, I tend to be a uh, a believer in in Paul Dipple's service leadership model of of analyzing the maturity of of uh, solution providers. He uses a five-tier method. I think you can simplify that a little bit into three if you need to, but they're different at different levels. When you're just starting out and understanding your, your business model, your needs look really different than that middle bit where, where you're maturing and you're understanding versus, again, those really top partners who have established their model. Now, immediately, everyone may say, oh, I want to go after those top partners. You may not because they may not want to display something that, that they've already established with. If they've standardized their offering or they know exactly what they are, if you're looking to displace, it may be much harder to get into there versus ones in that middle band who are starting to standardize and, and may be in the position of, of adopting your technology differently. And that's different, again, for each kind of vendor solution. So I say it's really important to start figuring out what are the different segments and what do they mean to you in order to give them the right message and help them self-select to, to what they're going to do with you. Exactly. I mean, I think it's, if you look at the power segmentation and the studies that are done about marketing out there, for every for every 100 emails you're sending out, it's like a 10 10 percent. 10.5% on average uptake if you really know your client and if you know what verticals you're going to, like with a solution provider. They're so under stress, and that's what my next uh, webinar coming up next month is all about, is it's about resellers. You look at these MSPs that everybody says that they want to go after or any type of resale company, these 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 people are getting 15, 20 calls from vendors calling and saying, hey, I got the next next best widget. Let me give you a demo. It, it just It isn't going to work. You, you need to know a lot more about them so that you can really segment them so your marketing team can, you know, in my opinion, can reach out to them and with the best case studies up front, with how your business models match and how you're gonna make them money, how you're gonna help them make that money, how you're gonna help them attract new clients in, in the verticals that they're working in. And yeah. not a general overall message saying, hey, you're a managed service provider, I got a managed service model, clients wanna buy my product, let's do a demo. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I have to laugh, Clint, because I mean, here I am, I'm, I'm what, almost a decade from being a solution provider, I still get calls for my solution provider business from vendors trying to recruit me. And and you have to laugh and go, really? Come on, you can do some basic investigation here to make sure you're, you're you know, to know something more about who you're calling by just pounding the phone because you're not getting to the right ones. You're right, you know, a typical solution provider is gonna be hearing from, you know, between five and 20 vendors on, a, on just, a, you know, almost a weekly basis who are trying to get their attention. You need to be better about your targeted message and the way that you're communicating to them to get through all of that noise. Yeah, because it's you know you're looking at what's my buyer persona, right? 
and what verticals are into and you may have several but as you market to them you you want that better uptake you want them to self-select more then the other piece you want is when you actually go out and you start your, your sales people out to start recruiting you want them to have the data about those companies about the resellers and what those resellers actually do it's not about looking at a website for five minutes before you call them and looking at linkedin and stuff like that it's having some real good detail about that business and understanding what that business does and how that business makes its money and what the person does within that organization that you're talking to and then calling them up and making a good case for you because when you get them on the phone that first time it's not like hey let me give you a demo because i got a great widget it's hey look i know this is your what you guys are doing this is how we work with companies like yours this is how we work in these so it goes right on to sales so when you're looking at bringing in the best resellers and not looking at i just want as many resellers as i can get now I'll, I'll, I'll sort them out as they come through in a, in a like you said a program that's stratified no let's stop that let's let's reach out to the first the best ones first when you call right. them recruitment and then that goes if you recruit the right ones with that day to day what's that do to your activation rate well absolutely it's going to improve it and, and you're going to spend a lot less time time and money wasted on ones that don't necessarily make sense and and the funny thing about this is this information is available now you know because of all of the technology and all of the stuff that, that we're capable of doing we can we can get access to this kind of data before we make the calls, as we build our lists, and as we target the, the message. It's all possible now. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways of looking at data and stuff. But I know you've gotten some uh, some bad data, <laughs> you know. But you know, it's it's interesting here to see you know how important uh, knowing your data is about uh, your prospects here. So everyone. By majority here, 69% say it's extremely important. Uh, 30, 31% say it's 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 uh, somewhat important, and, and no one falls below. Um, I am encouraged to see nobody is just saying don't care, just sell. Thank you for all for saying that because uh, I'm glad to see that's the, the correct strategy. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But you know, I also think too is everyone being honest <laughs> from that, right? Because you know, as I'm talking, I talk to hundreds of vendors on a course of a given month and. I can tell you a lot of them don't understand or, or have that either. They're, but they are thinking about it. That's, that, that is true. They are really thinking about it. They just haven't found the right source to really identify that. Um, so what do you, but you, you've gotten bad data. I've got bad data when I was back at Zenith and, and at Repbit and other companies that uh, we were buying lists and getting things. And uh, to me, you know, buying lists or just buying static pieces. What, what's your thoughts there on, on good data, bad data? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's there's a lot out there, and, I, and I, my advice these days is to be really critical of some of these data sources and understand where they're coming from, because a lot of this stuff is has aged and it hasn't aged well, um, and it's pretty beaten up. I, I think there's a lot of of you know, if you're just going out and getting lists, they're probably pretty badly abused over this over this time. You know, it, it, you're going to be calling Dave Sobel to sell him because he's an MSP. Oh, I know. Right? <laughs> I mean, I, it, it's it, it's stunning to me. It really is stunning to me that, that 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 still happens on a pretty regular basis, where it's pretty obvious what I do and where I where I fit in the channel. When somebody just calls and goes, "Hey, buy, you know, I want to sign you up as a reseller," it's like, really? Um, clearly, you you're not. You have done... Profile. Did you right. even think that company exists anymore? <laughs> right. Take take the quick second to understand this. This doesn't take much. And and some of that is is also like working on your process with those people that, that are engaging. You know, if they're not doing the basics there, it's it, you know, that's part of the process. You can speed that up by providing them good data, you know, by making sure that you are filtering, that you're looking at this critically, but being careful to not waste, you do burn a lot of uh you know a lot of of uh of goodwill when you when you do that oh yeah when you reach i know a lot of resources when you if you call them up say i want to do a demo uh you just shot you just shot yourself you're done <laughs> right i used to call that the myth of the of the uh, uh of the demo sales guy and you know uh would talk about that at, at shows when i went out to speak and stuff is that you know that that day is dead you know phone phone sales isn't dead phone i think is very very uh necessary and it's very necessary to talk to resellers in that process it's not it's it's a very relationship business like look here here i'm with you and laura's here and you know we do things together after that life right well but and laura's going to share the blast poll here's the result <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, okay. The other th the other thing that's really important to highlight is is that if if we go through the value chain here, the way a solution provider's customer is demanding uh, they engage that the solution provider engage has changed a lot. There's some real new data out there that says you know that the typical customer is running right around 78% of them have asked to be for the engagement to be measured based on business outcomes, not based on the technology. And in fact, only about 61% or so of solution providers have actually fully changed to that. There's still a disconnect there. I would posit, now this is slightly without data, but this is me looking at it as, as an observer of the channel, that I don't think the vendors have really gotten this. And they are, they're still talking about, hey, buy my product, it will solve your problem. Where it's like, that's not the problem that the solution provider is trying to solve. The solution provider is trying to solve the problem of how can I increase the value to my customer based on a business outcome? And nine times out of 10, that's around services, implementing something not just buying a product so you know my counsel to the other to the vendors is is look you know i get it you think buying your product solves the, the problem you're not listening to the core problem here and by having that good insight and good data you're going to understand who you talk to better and be able to tailor that conversation better yeah that was that's that's key and, and i talked to a really I, I find him to be a really sharp guy. I, I was speaking to yesterday that's in the MarTech space, and we were talking about his channel, what it was made up of, and he said, look, he said, I want the partners that are providing service to the clients. Mm -hmm. I no longer want an agency or someone that can send me a referral or they're, they're going to do an affiliate or something like that. I want someone that is going to take my product and build their services around it because they're sticking around and mm -hmm. they're growing clients and they're using they're truly using the product on behalf of the client and that's what i need because that's going to be sticky that's going to stay there for a long time and right you know so he, he really knew what he wanted to do and it's the same thing what you're saying it's about the business income uh, outcome anyone who go out and buy a crm right it, sure it's not about buying it. It's about getting the business value and the outcome that you want when you have it. Mm -hmm. And most companies, especially on, on a lot of CRMs, when you're talking that 25 to 50 man, even 75 uh, man organ or person organization, they don't have the time, know how, or what they to get out of it. Right. Well, that's why they're bringing in a solution provider. I mean, that's you know yeah, ultimately right. the value. That's the value that they're bringing. You know, the the vendors along the way need to understand. You know, need to really be focused on that and then be engaged in, in a very targeted way. Can I solve those problems correctly? Can I speak in that language and, and can I add that additional value? And that's where some of the disconnect gets. You know, again, if you're pounding the phone saying, hey, do a demo, do a demo, do a demo, it's like, you're not solving my problem. I don't, I'm not looking necessarily for technology. I'm looking for ways to, to be able to deliver those better outcomes. That's right, absolutely. And that's, that's one of the things that you, I think as you're looking at the data, where and I saw the the poll there. What was it? Eighty some percent, Laura, that were uh, yeah, giving the partners. Yeah, yeah, I'd be interested. Yeah, that's that's great that you you do it that way. It's good. It's good to get some of the data that way, um, depending on how you get it uh, and what and what information you're pulling. Make sure you're pulling the right one. Um, it's it's really hard, especially for account managers and people to get the right stuff in that they make mistakes and everything. So it's great that you're you're getting that. Uh, the other piece is how do you use that once once you you've got it would be interesting to know for me. Um, but it's good. Okay. You see, you're getting it from the onboarding. Your thoughts on that, Dave? I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, so I mean, this is typical. It's not what I was. You know, I'm not surprised by that data, but I would also offer that there are ways to do that better. You know, you can actually start looking at the, their their behaviors. You can look at their traits. You can understand the way that they are using the software and or or using your solution, the way they've engaged. And you can actually start building profiles around that by doing that. You work with with partners that help you automate that and help you deliver the insight. But that's totally possible. You know, for example, you know, if I'm looking, thinking about, I've worked a lot in the RMM space, for example, I've worked for a couple <laughs> of companies in that space. You can actually understand a lot about a partner based on the way that they deploy the software, how extensively, not just do they deploy it, but what features do they use, to what level, how 
uniformly, you can actually start looking at the data and you can understand a lot more about them. And it's been my experience that a lot of vendors are not going to that extra level to be much more targeted on that, that uh, you know, communication. Yeah, exactly, I, I, exactly. So um, I think we're coming up on the hour here, someone's telling me, so <laughs> I mean, it happened, but uh, it's coming down. So we do want to get some questions in, but I, I agree with you. I mean, and, and collecting the data right from the partner, uh, it's good data to have, but you want to augment that, you need to be able to organize it. And then how do you use that to discover and find all the net new ones that are doing the same things? Yeah, so, exactly. And and use that internal data to say, these are the good ones. They they look like this. They act like this. Now I can know those things about them and I can take that information and go look for those specific kinds. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, so uh, just a little shamelessly, that's what we do <laughs> is channel insights and and uh, DNA profiling of, of customers and of clients and, and of those partners that people already have or, or we can take the uh, the DNA profile or that IPC that we call it and find other ones out in the wild. So, you know, if you're interested in that, we can talk about that afterwards, but I want to get on to uh, some questions here. Uh, just the next slide, I'm going to bring up, I'd like the next slide we brought up. Just, we have another webinar coming up uh, on December uh, 6th. And in that one, we have some people that you'll recognize as well, Dave. <laughs> so oh, come on here. They're also solution providers. And we're going to be talking about tough love and advice from, uh, the reseller perspective on getting those, what what does that do to them when they get that five to 20 calls a, a month from or a week from each of the different vendors and how they think that you should be doing that as, as a vendor. You got so to smart people on that panel, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <yeah. laughs> so, uh, Lord, is, do we have some questions that we want to answer here uh, while we still have some time? We do. We have a couple questions just before the end here. What role do you see for specialty, distribu specialty distributors to accelerate new SaaS partner identification and recruitment? And that kind of goes along with several other questions that have come in at the same time, which is sort of how do you get the partner information before they become a partner now with, Dave, what you were talking about with these lists have been circulated and circulated and they're so really not accurate that are out there anymore. So what are you guys recommending to help, especially with the newer vendors that are coming up there to get the right partners? We yeah, kind of so talked I mean, about it. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit. I mean, I, I, I definitely think that you wanna be partnering these days with somebody that does do that kind of data management. You know, that's why there's organizations like SASMAC that do this to help give you some insight into it. That's the obvious, hey, we're on a webinar talking about it because they solve that problem. Um, you know, if you're trying to do it on, if you're trying to do it on your own, you know, you can go mine that kind of information. You can go start looking for it. Um, I typically tend to be one that says, hey, let's let's use some systems to do that. You're looking for growth information you're looking you you can mine that based on employees you can mine that based on time in business you can actually start looking if you're a distributor you probably know information about their spending habits like there's a lot of different things that you can start piecing together to start understanding that and being more comprehensive about that that actually is the approach that i say start looking at what you've got and then filling in the gaps with uh with partnerships great right, would you like to Comment on that as well. That is what we do. On a, on a, I don't want to be too, uh, I don't want to be too promotional here, but yes, that is what we do uh, in helping people understand uh, what they do have uh, and being able to be much more scientific about it than just collecting something from a form for a partner or something that a salesperson might put into a CRM. Uh, on that particular. I mean, I don't. I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. I mean, this is the kind of thing that people can do it on their own. But yeah. generally, that's why you work with somebody who's an expert in that to help you get there and do it. So I, what I'm laying at is, is the, hey, you can go do this on your own if you'd like, but yeah. there's a way to there's a way to partner to actually accelerate that. And plus, if you do it, if you really do it, you're trying to go in depth and to try and do that manually, and you got a thousand partners, you're it's it's by the time you get it done. Right. There's too much mistakes in it, and it costs you way too much money to do it. Well, and you start, and you have to, by the time you get to the end, you got to start back over again. So the answer <laughs> is, you right. can, you know, you can go do this. It is possible, but I generally, my inclination is to say, hey, you partner with somebody who thinks about this because you're going to see the 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 return on the investment. Right. Okay. And last question, and everybody, if we go longer, this is being recorded. Hopefully, the recording did 
come through, but I do want to get this one last question that just came in. If you have to drop off, know that we are recording. Clinton, um, question came in. Clinton talked about wanting partners that can add your product to their ongoing bundled services. What if your ACV is quite low and there isn't a lot of high margin value add services to layer on top? Yeah, I think what, whatever product that you do have, and there may not be a lot of uh, added value that you perceive to be there with your product, if you look at the companion product, so if you look at your product and how it sells, what else is feeding into it? What else is coming out of it? What other things are being sold along that alongside of that that would indicate they would need your product? And with that, look at the look at solution providers from them, I think, in that they can include that in the services that they're using with the other products that they're bringing it in in with. So for a reseller, it doesn't, and as Dave talked about with business outcomes, it's not, especially in the SaaS world, it's not about how much money the partner can make on commission selling your product. It's about how does it fit into his entire ecosystem. Now, you may never be a lead product for him or her uh, going to market, but you would be included within most every service package that they sell. Right, and I'd be, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna, you know, obviously I don't know the specific example here, but let me pull something that I think we can agree is all pretty friggin' commoditized, and that's email, right? So Microsoft sells Office 365. They talk about the fact that, you know, for every dollar they're making, there's at least $5 in services that are coming in through that. So my initial take on this is the, hey, you may be slightly dismissive of your, of your piece because you may not be understanding enough of how it fits into the way the solution provider does this is where you know solution provider advisory councils and, and stuff are really valuable to help you understand where you fit into that and where the high value services are around that don't focus so much on your product focus more on how does it fit into that total solution be comfortable fitting into a bundled package of managed services that's not a bad place to be because you're delivering a lot of value in the larger sense yeah, and that's kind of the same, like if you look at the managed service providers, if you look at like ad agencies and other ones on the MarTech side, they're delivering products with their services. Mm -hmm. And that's what they want to do because they want that services revenue. So you've got to find the right niche of, of where you fit into, whether it's an SEO company or whether it's a, an ad agency, where you fit within that stack and then go after it. Yep, totally. Okay, and with that, <laughs> Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Dave, for being here with us today. And I know the two of you guys could talk for hours and hours on this topic. And Dave, you've got your podcast that are doing it. And Clint, we just might have to have a start a show just with you just to talk about and all these different things or have Dave on a regular basis having conversations. But thank you both for all the great information that you presented today. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Hey, thanks, Dave. It's, as always, it's great. Say hello to, say hello to the wife and... Uh, <laughs> Maybe I'll get down that way sometime. <laughs> All right. And everybody, if you have any questions about today, if you need help finding the right partners for you, SAS Max is always is here. Clint's information is here, and we had posted Dave's information as well. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day, evening, whatever it may be for you and whatever time zone you are in listening. Uh, we'll be sending out a survey that will come up right after this. We would really appreciate your answering those three questions for us. Have a great day, everyone.